Uh, this is a viewer request video. It's on external and internal respiration. The outline to this is uh, first we'll talk about why gases move the way they do. Then we'll talk about the difference between external versus internal respiration. So first let's talk about why gases move. There are four rules or general ideas of why gases move. The first is the main one there is diffusion. Then we'll be talking about the thickness of the membrane and the wall, dealing pretty much with the rate of diffusion, difference in partial pressures, and the solubility of gases. So let's begin talking about diffusion. Here we have a container or a tub of water, and what I'm going to do is put this uh, little divider here in the middle. And then I'm going to add some solutes here into the equation. And at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see I have a little legend saying the solutes are the red dots. So we have a lot more on one side and we have fewer on the other side. These solutes represent salt in water, for example, or they can represent what we're going to be talking about, gases in water. So as you saw, a question came up here on the left-hand side saying, will the solute move from side A to side B, or will it move from side B to side A in order to reach homeostasis or an equilibrium? In other words, which way are these particles going to move so that we have an even amount on each side? Well, hopefully this one will be self-explanatory. As you look at it, we're going to move from side A to side B. As you can see, we have five on the left-hand side and five on the right-hand side. Now, number isn't important here. It's just like relative amount. And what's really going on is they're always going back and forth, just trying to keep the concentrations even on each side. So from side A to side B. So another question as well that's related, do solutes flow from high to low or from low to high concentration? Well, look at it. Which side has a higher concentration? Which side has more solutes, more gases, or more salt, for example? Side A. So it's going to flow from high to low, which is from side A to side B. Now let's look at the thickness of the membrane, or the wall that's dividing it. Let's make this wall a little bit thicker. So do you think a thick wall is going to make it more difficult or easier? In other words, is a thick wall going to make diffusion faster or slower for these solutes to get across to the other side. Well, think about like a castle. The bigger the barrier that you build, the harder it is for these solutes to go through. So it's going to take longer. So that's not going to be good if you think about the lungs. You, want, you don't want to have a hard barrier because when you're trying to breathe, you want these gases to flow through much easier. Okay, so here's the question that I was trying to uh, lead you into here. What type of epithelium do you think the alveoli of the lungs will have in order to make gas exchange quicker and easier from the air we breathe in to reach the blood in order to be transported to the rest of our tissues? Well, you can pause this and you can think about it. Okay, so hopefully you pause it and thought about it. Well, again, think of a castle and a wall. If you have a huge barrier, it's going to be hard to get through. Which one of these barriers looks the largest? Well, you might be thinking simple columnar or stratified squamous, but it's going to be stratified squamous. Just, there's going to be many more layers, like the layers of our skin, for example, protecting us from outside pathogens or anything getting inside our body. Uh, the, these other ones here, cuboidal columnar, these are more dealing with secretion. So it's going to be simple squamous. We have a much thinner barrier. Gases can diffuse through these cells much easier. Let's talk about partial pressures now. So I got two phases here, just two people. We got a red guy and we have a green guy inside of here. And the red guy is moving around and he's hitting the walls. He's exerting pressure on the walls, represented by those red marks on the wall. And then we have this green guy. As he starts to float around through here, he starts to hit the walls as well too. And he exerts his pressure on the walls. But what happens if we add more of these red guys inside of here and then they start swimming around? Well, naturally they're going to exert more pressure on more of the walls. And that's pretty much what partial pressure is. The more of a substance you have inside a fluid, for example, the more gases that you have, and these gases are always floating around, the more pressure they're going to exert on the container and upon each other. Right, let's try a question here. If atmospheric air at sea level 
is approximately 21% oxygen and 0.04% carbon dioxide, then which of these two gases has a greater partial pressure? Well, to have more pressure, you got to have more of yourself in there or more of that substance in that area. So naturally, if there's more oxygen, then it's going to have a greater partial pressure inside there. Let's try another question. For example, inhaled air has a partial pressure for oxygen. All right, and this is the symbol. You put a P representing partial pressure, and then the gas you're talking about, O2, oxygen, of about 160 millimeters of mercury. And carbon dioxide has a partial pressure of PCO2 of 0.3 millimeters of mercury. What is the total pressure of these two gases? Well, partial, meaning part. You have two parts, a part of oxygen and a part of CO2. Add the two parts together, and you end up with 160.3 millimeters of mercury. Good job. All right, let's move on. Number four, solubility. Solubility governs how much gas can be in a solution. Well, here's some facts. Carbon dioxide is the most soluble. It's the most soluble and therefore it could be transported in plasma much easier. So that's actually a topic when I discuss gas transportation that we'll come back to. But right now, what does it mean solubility? Is it means it stays in that solution much better. For example, let's say you had a cup of water and you put some salt in it, it's gonna be soluble, and you put a little bit more salt, and you put a little bit more salt, but the more salt that you put in there, you're actually gonna start seeing it. Because before when you're putting in a little bit and you, and you stir it, it tends to dissolve in there, but then it starts to um, precipitate, which means it's not soluble anymore. You've oversaturated it. But with gases, the gases, well, they're lighter than the water. They're less dense, so they're going to tend to flow out of the water. So as you see at the legend on the bottom left, the oxygen is represented by the red dots, CO2 by the green. And again, I'll do that, show you what happened, is we had much more of the oxygen leave Right, just look at that. A lot of the red dots are leaving. Just one of those green dots is going to leave. So CO2 is more soluble. It's going to stay in the solution much better. Let's continue on to external respiration. Right, there's external and there's internal respiration. You've probably seen your textbooks and you've seen externals at the level of the lungs or the alveoli and internals at the rest of the body. But we just kind of want to visualize this a little bit first. So we take our big breath of air in, and air goes into our lungs. So down at the end of that point, at the lungs, that's where external respiration is going to happen. It's a little counterintuitive because you're looking inside the body, but it says external. Well, remember, we're still connected to our external environment. If you could, you could put your hand all the way down inside your throat, down your windpipe. What is that? Hopefully you remember, that's your trachea. Down your trachea, which would be the windpipe here, through your bronchi and down to the final little grape sacs. What are those things? Those are the alveoli. So you get down to the alveoli, you're still connected to the outside, so they call the external. The difference with internal is now we get into the blood. We're even more internal, and we're getting into our tissues. So that's why we call this internal and external respiration. If you remember my video here, and if you don't, you can go look at it. It's called blood flow made easy. I drew this diagram out. I called it the infinity diagram. It shows you how the blood's going to flow, left atrium, left ventricle, out to the body, around, down into the lungs, and back to the left atrium. Well, if you're still using that diagram, external respiration is over here on this side, and internal is over onto the other side. So you can keep adding onto this diagram. All right. So let's look more specifically at external respiration, which is at the alveoli. If we take a little piece of the alveoli with the capillaries surrounding it and we zoom in on it, on this picture I'm um, borrowing from Pearson here, you can see that there is blood flowing in on the capillary and it has these partial pressure numbers. And then the alveolus, a little section of it right there with this partial pressure of their gases. And then the partial pressures, pressures over here. What we need to do is isolate each gas one by one. So we'll look at the oxygen values. As blood is returning back to the lungs, it has a partial pressure of 40 millimeters of mercury, mmHg. The alveolus has a PO2 of 100, and after it leaves the alveolus and starting to head back to the left atrium, 
as a PO2 of 100. So let's make a little simplified diagram of this. All right, so this at the bottom I'm showing you the blood flow direction and the capillaries. If you look back here, that's the blood flow going down this way. Uh, the PO2 is 40. Again, looking back here, you see the PO2 of 40, the PO2 of 100, and the alveoli is the same, and then PO2 100 after we leave. I drew this here because, again, what type of epithelial membrane do we have here for the alveolus and the capillaries? Is it columnar? Is it cuboidal? Is it stratified squamous? No, hopefully you remember it's simple squamous. It has one layer of flat cells, such as the endothelial cells right here, the blood vessel and around the capillary as well, too. Okay, so this is what we're going to do here. We're going to show blood flowing in here. The red dots, if you look at the bottom left, left, represent the oxygen. So we have a relative pressure of, or a partial pressure of 40. In the alveoli, it's higher at 100. So what we need to do now is compare the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli to the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood flowing from the capillary towards the alveoli. So let's remember back to what we just did about diffusion. We had side A and we had side B. Which side had the higher concentration? Well, side A. And again, it's going to flow from low to high or high to low. It's going to flow from high to low, so from side A to side B. And that same exact idea now, when we go back to the alveoli and to the capillaries, so which way is it going to flow? From the alveoli into the capillary? Or is oxygen going to flow from the capillary into the alveoli? Well, where do we have a higher partial pressure? Look at the alveoli. We have a PO2 of 100. And then over at the capillary, we have a PO2 at 40. So as the blood flows by, oxygen will join from the alveoli. Again, I'll repeat it once more. Oxygen flows through and continues to oxygenate the rest of the body as it returns to the left atrium. And as you see, we have homeostasis, which means we have a balance now of the PO2. And that's how it equilibrates and how that's, it knows that's enough is because it's going to match. We have 100 here and we have 100 over there. So that's why when you look at this diagram, O2 is heading into the capillaries over here. Okay, let's... Uh, try CO2 now. So we need to take the values of CO2. You can see the 45 as it's approaching the alveolus, the 40 in the alveolus, and the PCO2 of 40 as it's leaving on the capillary. So we're going to do the same thing again here, but now we change the colors and we change the gases. The legend's at the bottom left of corner of this uh, screen. So hopefully by now you're starting to get the idea where do we have a high concentration of CO2 and where do we have a low? Well, the blood flowing towards the alveoli, as you can see, it's higher. The concentration of CO2 in the alveoli is lower. So what's going to happen? Well, as it flows by, CO2 is going to enter into the alveoli and then we're going to breathe it out. And that's why we breathe out CO2 versus O2, which we breathe in and we're going to have homeostasis at the end it's going to match its number, 40 and 40. So the partial pressure changed about 5 millimeters of mercury. Now hopefully this diagram is starting to make a little bit more sense. As you see here, the PCO2 is 45 and it's 40, so we're going to go from high to low. And that's why you see this green arrow, or the arrow here, is showing you that CO2 is going to the alveolus in order to be um, exhaled and then it's going to change this down to 40. So there's a drop in 5 millimeters of mercury. So realistically, what's happening? Well, both of these are happening at the same time. So you'll see O2 come into the blood and CO2 leaving the blood and going into the alveoli. And it's going to continue. The CO2, some O2 will be exhaled, but the majority of the O2 will come into the blood. So just one more time, there's going to be a change in diffusion across the membrane of both gases. And so external respiration, both O2 and CO2 are moving together, but in opposite directions. Now internal respiration should be much easier to understand once you understand external. All you're going to be doing is reversing the flow or the pathway of both the gases. 
So again, internal, what does it mean? Internal means at your body tissue cells, such as your myofibers, which are going to be your muscle cells that you can see over here, your adipocytes, your fat cells, other uh, epithelial cells that could be in there, uh, cuboidal cells, whichever, any, anything basically in the body other than your lungs, immune cells as well, and again, lots of other cells in the body. So here's a question. Why does oxygen diffuse into the tissues as the blood arrives on the capillaries? And what is the change in PO2 of the blood as the capillaries leave the tissues? Well, of course try to pause this and think about it, but I'll continue here. Well, the first part. Why does oxygen diffuse into the tissues as blood arrives? Well, let's look at our values. We have a 95 up here. We have a 40 there. We have a 40 down there at the bottom. The first two ones are the more important ones. We have 95, we have 40. And what's the rule here? Well, diffusion. And diffusion, which way do solutes move, or gases, for example? From high to low. So that's why we go from our 95 to our 40. And that's why you see this arrow here, why oxygen enters into the tissue. And we continue. What is the change of PO2 of the blood as the, ca of the, blood as the capillaries leave the tissues? Well, the PO2 is 95 here and 40 here. We do a little math, so there's a difference of 55 millimeters of mercury. So you could do the same thing with CO2. As you would see, there's 40 over here and there's 45. So we're going to go from high to low CO2 partial pressure concentration. So that's why the CO2 is going to enter here into the capillary to return back to the right atrium and then eventually the lungs to get more oxygen and to breathe out the CO2 as well. Now, something uh, you might be thinking as you look at these values over here, well, actually, let's look over on this side. You see that the PO2 is 40, and the alveoli is 100, and then again, it's 100. But when you look back at the container, we, sh we show that solutes are going to move over. So you might be wondering, why is it not 40, uh, the difference between there, you know, why is it not like somewhere between 60, 70, 80? Like, how is it both going to be 100? Well, the thing is that, you're always breathing in oxygen. you got to consider like you have an unlimited or an infinite supply inside your alveolus because you're always breathing in oxygen. So you can pump an unlimited amount until you reach homeostasis or equilibrium. The same applies for uh, the CO2 over here. We're at the cells. Your cells are always making CO2. So you have an unlimited supply, which is producing about a partial pressure of 45. So it's going to equilibrate to be 45 and 45. Again, just keep in mind the diagram that we used. Again, if you want to find this, look up blood flow made easy, and uh, you'll find how we got this diagram of the heart. But external is happening at the level of the lungs, and internal is happening at the rest of the body. If you have any more requests of videos you would need, let's say you have an exam coming up shortly, then feel free to email me at jrufael at gmail.com. Thank you.